no Mickey show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed. Deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights, highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. continues. The No Miki Show. <laughs> Good evening. It is Wednesday, November 3rd, 2010, the day that we got shellacked. No, actually, this is not 2010. No, actually, this is not 2004. This is not 2013 or 14. This is 2021. This is the year when we thought, oh, maybe the Democrats got their act together after they had been bulldozed several elections, after they knew the Democratic leadership knew that this was coming. We thought maybe, just maybe, people are actually afraid of fascism. Maybe we'll be able to mobilize Democrats because in the last few elections they have turned out at record rates. Maybe that would happen. And they did turn out. And so did the Republicans. Because you know what the Republicans do very well? They turn out when they're angry and when they're scared. The narrative today after the election last night in which Terry McAuliffe lost uh, his former position uh, in, in Virginia, he had overwhelming name ID and uh, fundraising prowess unlike anyone other in the Democratic Party, Terry McAuliffe lost to a first-time candidate. And that is at the failure of the Democrats. There is nowhere else to look. You saw uh, races in New Jersey, very tight. Governor Phil Murphy Got, was was said to be a, a, a victor. It was two o'clock in the morning and it was still too close to call, but he was still ahead. It wasn't supposed to be so close, but I'm getting sick of saying this. People who have political science degrees have political science degrees because they're able to map this stuff out. They're able to understand trends. They're able to see what's coming before it happens. Yet somehow I think the Democratic Party has zapped all the political so science majors out of the party or they're completely blinded by the money. When we're drowning and we're underwater, I really hope that money keeps you warm or afloat. You can build a raft out of it because that's about all the use it's going to have for you. When you're, your fifth house, as I've said over and over again, I'm becoming beyond a broken record, that fifth house is not going to protect you from climate change. And that's at stake. And I think that uh, today, as, as this week, COP26 going underway, underway in Scotland, folks are getting more and more frustrated on all sides of the aisle because there is insecurity, there is instability. The Republicans are preying on it and pointing to things like the progressives and the woke, woke party and culture wars, and that's what they do. But what the Democrats do, and I'm talking about institutional Democrats, what the Democrats do in leadership who are making these decisions, who are moving the money into places, who are siding with campaigns to invest in, or are blocking progressive candidates, or fighting off progressive candidates, who are backing, uh, you know, centrist Democrats who really have no interest or, or need to be in, 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 in politics. What they're doing is nothing. But today, you would think that the progressives controlled everything. You would think looking at the news that, oh, the progressives and the online culture, it's gotten too far. It's too far. And that's why the right wing is turning out. No, the right wing is turning out because they own every single media space. The right wing is turning out because they will literally, literally create something that turns people out. They will make something that doesn't even exist. Critical race theory. And they will turn that into a weapon, a culture war. That is not, that didn't start by the left. That started by the right. Democrats didn't lose because the progressives exist online. Democrats lost because number one, they did not anticipate the turnout of Republicans in a midterm and the, the power of the culture wars Republicans push out there. And number two, the Democratic Party does not exist. No, I mean, literally, it doesn't exist. It's an idea. It's a club. It's a group of, of, of donors who back a group of candidates who are often insiders in the industry, CC Joe Manchin. But it is not an actual party. Sure, there's a building in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. 
Sure, there's a Democratic Party in New York State that clearly is still, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the heart is pumping still with the help of Republicans. There is a Democratic Party in California, but there is barely a Democratic Party anywhere else in this country. And what does that mean? It means you do not have money flowing into districts that should be blue at this point, like Pennsylvania, like Virginia, like uh, Arizona. They should be blue at this point, like Wisconsin. But when you don't have a vibrant party, and I don't mean there aren't people there that are doing great work trying to organize. I mean, the money that is coming in that people are donating is not going into a long-term plan, a sustainable plan for the Democratic Party so that they can recruit candidates from the bottom all the way to the top, so they can recruit volunteers from the bottom to the top, and most importantly, so they can get the message out about what it means to be a Democrat. And that is a big question, I think, at this point. What does it mean? If you are not telling people who you are, the other side is going to do it for you. And let me be very clear, the progressives are not telling the world what the Democratic Party is. And the Democratic Party is blaming it on progressives today. They're saying Terry McAuliffe lost because AOC is on Twitter. Terry McAuliffe lost. He had more money than you could imagine. He lost because the Democratic Party is not a party. It is basically a super PAC (laughs) that has a line on the ballot. It has a lot of election attorneys and a lot of connections in the media. I'm getting so sick of saying this stuff over and over again, but clearly it has to be said. If the Democratic Party wants to win elections, that's a big if, then they have to change their business model. They are not a transparent party. They don't have budgets approved by a democratic process. They're still appointing people to oversee the rules of the DNC at a national level, people that are consultants, not people who are elected. Meanwhile, the actual elected members of the Democratic Party don't have much say in that process. It's kabuki theater. And so these elections where they're raising millions and millions and millions of dollars in the presidential elections where it's now like a billion dollar election. There is a prime opportunity for that money to go into work. I mean, listen, just take 15% of it and invest them into state parties. And when I say state, I'm not talking about like being a Democratic Party hack. I'm talking about having a movement on the ground. I am talking about winning elections so that we don't have these insane Republicans, these right-wing conspiracy theorists beating Democratic Party candidates. And yes, it is about the candidates too, of course. But when you have a vibrant party, a local party, an organizing party that is a decentralized all over the country party, recruiting candidates and spreading their ideas in between elections, it is harder for these crackpots to break through. We all know people that 20 years ago were Democrats and now are Trumpsters. I wonder how many of those people would have stayed as Democrats if they didn't feel abandoned, literally abandoned by their party. The difference between now and after 2016 when we have this argument is now we feel the crisis in a much more pronounced way. It's not a question of when climate change is going to start to engulf us. It's how we are going to mitigate whatever we can with the remaining time we have on this planet. And when the process becomes clearer and clearer and you look at folks like Joe Manchin, who's so overwhelmingly involved in the the coal industry and his daughter with the EpiPen scandal, and you see how this guy's been able to stay in power for this long and, and put you know have hissy fits to keep that power. And you see Chuck Schumer pretend like he has nothing to do with controlling Joe Manchin. You see Joe Biden person. And you start to realize, oh, these are just a few little human decisions. These are just a few little human decisions here and there that are determining the fate of this planet. Are you going to let a few people get in the way of the fate of this planet? Because as much as the Democratic Party's strategy needs to change, and I could talk about that for another 15 minutes, that ain't going to happen anytime soon. You know whose party do- whose strategy does need to change? Ours. India Walton's loss was 
absolutely a result of Byron Brown, the Demo- New York State Democratic Party, partnering up with the Republican Party, with Republicans, because there's no Republican Party in New York. Absolutely. But we know that's going to happen. That can't be our excuse. Just like we know that they're going to blame us for everything. Just like the Democrats know it's actually the Republicans. They actually know whose fault it is. We can't do the same stuff. We can't sit there and say, oh, it's because of the real estate industry. This It is. Now what are we going to do about it? How are we going to out-organize? I know there are a lot of coalitions that came together for India Walton's race. I would love to see how deep that organizing was. And if it wasn't as deep, and if it wasn't as rooted in community, and if people made money off of that, or if the polling wasn't as accurate, we, in a prog- as a progressive movement, need to assess that stuff too. Because there are a lot of organizations and people out there in the business of making money off of the new progressive all-star. How do we back this candidate, put ads out, make money, and we're doing the same thing that the Democrats did? But we must be better. Is this about winning? Or is this about the political industrial complex? We're a young movement. We definitely need institutions. But we have to do better. We have a wonderful show today. We have Rep. Rab and Arun Chowdhury here to talk about last night. And then later we have Josh Fox on to talk about COP26 and what's happening with our climate goals. Stick around. Sunset Lake CBD is that magical farmer-owned company that ships craft CBD products directly from their farm to your door. Sunset Lake CBD has all sorts of products for everybody, whether it's coffee or salves or gummies or tinctures, and they're all designed to help you with your aches and pains. They're originally a farm. They like changed and diversified a farm in Vermont that was a Ben & Jerry's farm. Uh, They are doing the great work of improving their community through sustainable agriculture and providing meaningful employment, employment, enhancing the rural economy of Vermont. They pay their workers a $15 minimum wage and their workers own the majority of their company. And then on top of all that, they are supportive of independent media like our show, the Nomi Key Show, the Majority Report, and the David Pakman Show. Um, they, I, I mean, we talk about their products all the time. I now have those little rolled joints, CBD joints, uh, which help me when I get my migraines, which I had one the other day and I, I woke up with it and I took a little bit of that and it cured it. It was amazing. And it calms you down at the same time without making you a little high like other things do. Um, I work with all the sorts of products. I have this amazing lotion now that has, has CBD and hemp and it's, I put it on my back when I have a sore back. It's a real quality product. You know I talk about it all the time. I have tried CBD at other places. It does not have the same effect. Sunset Lake CBD is really the best CBD I've ever had. And it prevents me from doing other things because it's so effective and I can still work throughout the day um, having used their products. It also helps me sleep. You... If you haven't tried it yet, you can get 20% off of your entire order. If you go to sunsetlakecbd.com and type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, you go to sunsetlakecbd.com, type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, and you will get 20% off of your entire order. There's a new tincture out right now. It has 1,200 milligrams of CBD oil infused with 90 milligrams of melatonin. It helps you get to sleep and stay asleep. That's the combination. It's really effective, especially if you're like me. I can't sleep at night. So I definitely recommend you go check that out. That is out as as, right now. It's a new product. Yeah, it's out on the market. All right. We'll be right back after this break. All righty, we're back. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. It is that time when, you know, you've been waiting for it. Uh, Rep. Rab, uh, busy guy. He's, 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 he's representing his district in Northwest Philadelphia, 200th district uh, in Pennsylvania. He's one of the few progressives there, and he had like an amazing election where he turned out that district better than anyone did, and he does the real work. Uh, and he is in Tampa, Florida right now at some weirdo legislative conference. It's, I guess, very normal. And it's it's amazing to have someone on the inside tell us what's going down. Let's bring Rep. Rab in. And then uh, straight out of Lithuania. <laughs> we That's have a t-shirt. A U.S. elections expert coming in. He is the host of the committee program. And, of course, uh, the 
founder of the committee. <laughs> I don't know, managing director. I don't know what he actually is. Where's a run? Bring a run, Chowdhury in. I'm a director. You know, as a, a film guy, I just like to use director and leave it at that. I'm a director too of Matriarch. Yeah. I guess I'm a, I am, and I'm, a, and I'm doing a director. I'm a director of a documentary. So maybe I should I say I'm a film person now? Am I a film person, Ron? <laughs> Listen, you know, I, I have school. a lot of student loans still pending that I use <laughs> to leverage that, and I shouldn't put that burden on you. So please call yourself whatever, but understand why it's hard for me. Okay. Um, did you go to school for political science? Because I did. And you are working <laughs> as a political strategist. So I think it's an equal trade. Uh, political economy actually was my minor. Exactly. Yeah. That's bullshit. That is not a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, me and Karl Marx, uh, you know. Uh. Yeah. And there's... <laughs> Who's quoting whom now? <laughs> I think Arun said it when. <laughs> we need to seize the means of. Oh, All right. boy. Um, let's start off with what's happening in Tampa. I'm so sorry you're in Tampa. In no, 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 no. Marriott. No. Yeah. <laughs> don't feel sorry for me. I, um, I, I went here willingly. Um, this is the National Conference of State Legislatures, it's the largest bipartisan association of its kind, where state legislators from uh, all 50 states and territories uh, convene um, to discuss state-level um, issues uh, from, you know, anything from climate action to agriculture to law enforcement, you name it. And as you were saying, um, off air, <laughs> um, there's a exhibition room. Um, I've been going to these things now. Well, we missed it last year because of the pandemic. It's been delayed 15 months. Uh, but these are massive, massive expos where there are folks who are selling, trying to sell everything to anyone who can. So uh, state agencies, uh, legislators themselves, um, you name it. So uh, uh, it could be anything from um, uh, low velocity electric vehicles to tasers to uh, high end uh, cow manure, you, I mean, anything and everything under the sun. Um, we are the uh, uh, the labs of democracy, right? Uh, can, can I ask you a, a question about that? Because just to yeah. put this in, in in greater context for folks, when you say they're selling things, this is this isn't lobbying, right? Like that's another form of that we're all semi familiar with. But they're selling no, something to get into a budget. I mean, they're like like yeah, okay, so right, you're in the legislature, right. you're in charge of the budget. So if our city or our state wants to buy. Uh, a bunch of militarized vehicles, slightly used. Don't worry, it, it was from Afghanistan, but we're going to bring it to Pennsylvania. It makes sense. Right. This is where they. Right. they yeah, they but not local, that. only state, only state. Only state. And they're not selling on the, on the expo floor. They're promoting what they do and exchanging cards so that folks who are in a position of power. And maybe do business later. <laughs> maybe do business later, right? Because they have a lot of parties um, and, uh, you know, free flowing alcohol and all of that. So, yeah, we'll be in Harrisburg this day, right? Like, just wanted you to know we're throwing this party and wanted you to come. And so everything that's happening here happens every day in Harrisburg. Um, there are no campaign contribution caps in Pennsylvania for state-level uh, office. Um, there is no gift ban. So a lobbyist could buy me. I could walk off the House floor, and they could say, here are keys to a new Tesla or a pickup truck. I have truck. a brilliant idea. I just thought of this. Okay. No, I'm not going to say that loud. I think I might get in trouble, man, from YouTube. But <laughs> we were waiting. Yeah. I'm sorry. I like. I started to spin. I'm like, oh god. Sometimes I come up with these ideas. I'm like, I can't say them out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make it because I might be forced to put it in legislation, and then we'll both. Be, uh, <laughs> I said, I, I'm really upset. It should have been not a parody. If you just say it's a parody, it's not a parody. Number one. Number two. Um, it was a little incrementalist in terms of the vasectomy. It's not a parody if you're telling people who like had four kids and are over 40. No, the point is get the young ones, the ones who are like jacked up on, you know, <laughs> causing problems <laughs> and just go for the whole thing. Um, okay, that's not my <laughs> Next term, maybe. <laughs> I think I have enough death threats to last me for, for a while now. Um, I was going to say, if it was a woman, it would have been really, really dangerous. So I, I am, yes, in all honesty, yeah, very grateful yeah. that you have been a great ally in, in taking this uh, to the legislature, parody or not. Um, Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. And and what uh, it allowed me to do uh, over the past several weeks is to let people know 99% uh, for the first time that as absurd as my bill was supposed to be, that we actually passed a bill in June with re Democratic support to force a woman to have a yeah. funeral, uh, a cremation or burial for 
a miscarried egg, which is imperceptible to the human which eye. Which is bananas. a miscarried egg, which flushes Fertilized down the egg, toilet yes. sometimes. I don't mean which I'm is, not well, I mean, just, can't even, yeah, I mean, organic be, waste. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what we passed in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. It didn't get um, to the governor's desk, and obviously he would have vetoed it. He's very pro-choice. But where where is the outrage there? Where is corporate yeah. media talking about that? They were silent, um, as were most institutions, except for the women on the front lines who were talking about reproductive justice every day. And I wanted to, to lend my voice as a cis, hetero, proud father of two boys who uh, willingly got a vasectomy to, to do my part uh, in fl- family, family planning when I didn't want to put the mother of my children at risk for another pregnancy. And that was a de- private decision that I decided to go public with because there's so many um, women legislators all over who are having, having to tell their story on the House that's floor. Right. And that's the fact that they would ha- they would feel that that's what they would have to do to appeal to the predominantly male institutions that are invading their uteruses mm-hmm. is 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 mind boggling. And so the, the the outrage that these snowflakes have come at me with because oh how dare you put the government in my bed you know whatever I'm like are you not paying attention? Of course they're not because they don't have to because of of male privilege. And that that made it all worth it to me. And uh, eventually, more men were starting to reach out, saying, "I appreciate what you're doing too." Because at first, it was all women. I'm like, "Where, you know, where are the dudes?" This, mm-hmm. this, you know, it felt. But this very is a best sex me only okay. show, Arun. You've, you've, uh, I don't mean, you've said it before. That's not why I'm, I'm not like. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm a proud you. owner of a vasectomy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you get a vasectomy, and you get a vasectomy. That's right. Do you have your vasectomy ID card? Because that's the next thing I'm working on. As an, ins- ah. as a, as a post inseminator, I think it's important that we have a registry. A post yeah. insemination yeah. registration oh, of- database. Yes. You I'm get ten percent off of Ben and Jerry's ice cream when you show up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Brad says vasectomy passports. <laughs> That's right. Okay, okay. I don't know how we got on this tangent. Okay, let's go back to the um, inside baseball stuff because, Arun, yeah. you have been to these things too. From your perspective, like, how does the. I, mean, I promise we will get to election news, guys, but I think this is a great segue in because this is how this shit happens. Is Little by little, increment. I mean, this the, the yeah. way the sausage is made, the way these relationships are built. Because it's not just that they're selling stuff. There is sort of an inherent lobbying quid pro, pro quo thing that happens too, right? No, I mean, yes, of course, suggestion of this, and you can get that, and there's a party, and maybe it's a trip. But it also, it also is just what happens when you inject that kind of commerce into sort of the purchasing systems of states, because. For some people, it's not like they wake up that day wanting to be evil or steal money from their state or something. It's just this relationship was already established, maybe even by somebody before, and it's just easier. And it's like, yeah, now we got to buy all the paper cups that the state needs for the next three years, which it turns out is $5 million for 40 million of them or like, you know, whatever crazy thing it is. And it's just easier to not have to do all that extra work of making sure you're looking at different bits and different contracts. And I met this nice fella. He seemed cool at this thing. It's uh, sometimes it's just, you know, it's just making this thing a smorgasbord. Somebody's going to eat. It's crazy. You know, there needs to be like systems, maybe even a federal system for how uh, contracts are done with any kind of government. There just needs to be more accountability and less showmanship. We need less P.T. Barnum's hawking us tasers uh, at these events that are ostensibly for legislatures in between things not to be hanging out and looking at tasers, but to be talking to each other. Presumably there is some value in having progressives, having conservatives, having whoever it is who think alike in different states be in the same place to maybe talk about some solidarity. I think it's good. Actually, that's that's how I met you, Brad. what we're doing. Oh, that's right. We were at this one conference in, in, uh, we were in D.C., was it? Yeah, and we were at a table. No, I think it was, I I don't remember there's just so many uh, of these things. That we're not I trying know, to like yeah. brag, but um, right. Yeah, but we were at a table. There was a New York senator and a New York assemblywoman. Uh, Rep. Brad was there. I think a couple other people. But it was we were having this like very. It was a it was progressive table, and obviously I'm yeah. not in the legislature, but progressive it was, it was, majority. Maybe senator? it was progressive majority. Yeah, I think huh. I was in town for something else, and I just you know yeah, met y'all right. in the yeah. lobby or something. <laughs> yeah, but those things are good. Yeah. 
it's especially good when you have in so I came down for a pre conference meeting for the energy supply task force which are all the uh, state policy makers state lawmakers who are really into energy policy so there were there were super right wing republicans and there were well, I, I was probably the, the most left democrat by far there talking about energy policy so the interesting thing about this 9 hour meeting yesterday was that all the republicans were what i call energy agnostics so they believe mm-hmm. in all of the above. So they're not mm-hmm. against solar or mm-hmm. wind or geothermal. They're, they're for like, hey, let's have wind, but let's have coal too. Which let's for me, is, right, which is, you know, odd. But if they're coming from coal country, they're going to promote coal. Um, so th- they are a unique group of conservatives who I can have a conversation with that's science-based, even though we don't agree. Like i I don't believe we need um, to reinvest in coal or, or frack Keep gas, ground, et cetera, y'all. et cetera. Yeah. E- exactly. Keep it in the ground. So we have different perspectives, but we we all respect the science. Um, and that's unique because in, in Harrisburg, we have more uh, fossil fuel uh, and, and frack gas lobbyists than we have actual legislators. And there's 253 that's of right. us as legislators, which is nuts. So this is a unique moment for me to actually talk policy in the most substantive sense, behind the scenes, no cameras, no politicizing, just talking about the merits of all these different things and learning from each other. And that's super rare. I had to go all the way to Tampa for that. But then I get to come back home to the state capitol and say, hey, look, I talked to some of your fellow you know, right wing Republicans, and this is what they're saying. So they'll listen when yeah, I yeah, they got reference. some things going on. I wanted to bring up with you, you know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that actually creates a bridge for a conversation. And frankly, you know, whenever you're kind enough to promote the fact that I actually get legislation enacted into law in Pennsylvania, despite being in a right wing uh, institution, it's because I build these relationships. Yep. And unfortunately. A lot of these folks need to be drunk in order to have these conversations. So I'm the sober guy in the oh, yeah. room, you know, trying to, you know, talk policy. And I, I, I will go to Tampa. I will go to wherever I need to go to have those conversations. Because if you don't build familiarity and comfort with folks who you do not have the same priorities and values as, um, you're not going to move your agenda forward. And, and, that, I, and I that's, a, that. that's such a big lesson, Um so I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about the election, but but specifically, I mean, at the end of my opening, I, I said s- the first part of my opening was really just about how the Democrats still suck and the Democrats are still doing the same things. And do we expect anything different? No, it's just now uh, we're, we're, we're at a point of no return. And before it was like we had this moment where we thought maybe we could do something, we have some leverage. So I want to shift gears because um, I want to highlight a race in Buffalo. Uh, I grew up in Buffalo, as you may know. Yeah. Um, India Walton, uh, of course, she's a, she's a DSA member. She uh, won the primary against uh, Mayor Byron Brown. Byron Brown was the chair of the New and York State. And she's a Democrat. And she's a Democrat. Sorry, which, which, right? No, no, but this is important, right? Like she's yeah. a Democrat and won the Democratic primary. Totally normal stuff. Like, <laughs> totally normal. Anyway, please continue. Yeah. He was, um, he's the, he was the former chair of the New York State Democratic Party, which is actually not an operational party. It was Cuomo who, let's not forget, just had to resign. Um, it was Cuomo's like slush fund, essentially. It was like how he gave out, you know, friends and family and lobbyists like rewards for being on this committee, and then, uh, and then it became a slush fund. So it doesn't actually. There's, you know, th- th- New York is like mostly Democrats, right? So Byron Brown um, loses because there's no party and there's there's nothing to. He didn't run. He just was like, oh, there's I'm running against someone. He did a Crowley. Like I didn't show up, and. Um, and then the Republicans, they 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 staged this write-in campaign. There were Republican donors, which I think are getting more attention because they're Republican now, but some of them used to be Democrats, like Carl Palladino used to be a Democrat. And they funded uh, Byron Brown's uh, write-in campaign, and he, he, he didn't just win. He crushed India Walton. He so really won. Crushed yeah. her. So I'm not going to sit here and say, do the thing that everybody's doing. Oh, it was a Republicans partnering up the Democrats. That's that. We know that's going to happen. We have to be prepared for what is going to happen. The question is, what do we do? What are we doing wrong as progressives? Because we have to wise up real fast because this is happening in different ways. We got to wise up real fast. What are we doing? I'm going to throw out one. 
we don't have enough institutions and the institutions that we do have are doing following, doing the same things that the Democrats did. They're more concerned about making money off of candidates. They find a big shiny, like India Walton, nobody cared about her until she won. And then everybody swept in and was like, well, you can pay me for field. Well, guess how great that field was? Did it work out? No. Um, and you bring in the, the, the other leaders in and then she's raising money and she's raising money, which she should, but there's something that's missing. And I think there's some of it's even a little predatory on progressive candidates. Go ahead, Ryan. Sorry. Uh, yes. I, I think she probably spent money in the wrong places. I think the wrong people got involved. I don't know who that is. I'm willing to blame all of them because that's the easy target. And, you know, and uh, 75% was correct. We just did it. But but what the problem is, and I don't know that it's what we're doing wrong, although we will have to fix it because the people want to, is that the Democratic Party, the too big to fail Democratic Party, has half of it that does not feel loyalty to the other half, and the other half who feels begrudging loyalty to the one half, uh, which is not only uh, a recipe for losing elections exactly in the proportions that this election was lost, but is a, a proportion for more polarization to continue to happen and to continue to get worse because there's a resentment gap at some point <laughs> that's just building, uh, not to be too Cold War about it. So, uh, uh, what do you do about a huge problem like that? Like, it's not doing field wrong. It's that there are certain people who are like, I will not support that woman. Like, I will, like, you know, there is something anathema to me that I do not, I cannot see myself falling in line and voting for the Democrat in this case. And just the people who we as progressives vote for, just this murderer's row of, frankly, murderers, <laughs> and like you're like oh like the things we put up with and this wonderful woman who won the democratic primary square on the nose you can't just like you can't bite the apple you don't like a little bit for this i don't know i don't know the answer but i'm absolutely outraged Brad, and not I mean, the republicans why yeah. shouldn't they play hard it's, it's interesting. So here's a tweet from uh, India Walton the day before the election, specifically just calling it out. These are the Republicans. This is how Trump and his Republicans attack Democrats. Byron Brown is a Republican. He has joined the party of Trump. I'm the Democrat. You should vote for me and the rest of Democrats. It's pretty simple. So, I mean, I, I have thoughts about this. Um, you know, they have this Stop Socialism campaign. I don't think that the, the counter to their attacks is to call him a Republican. I I mean, I think that works for some people to do. I don't think it's something the candidate does. Um, you know, I think what makes people love her is, is her. And that feels very, uh, you can, I believe you can win hearts and minds. I'm call me old fashioned, but my mother used to be a lawmaker, uh, a legislator like yourself. And she would win in a three to one Republican district as a Democrat, as a progressive Democrat. And how did she do it? An independent Democrat. She you know, she ran three times, so that's part of it. But also, it was just old-fashioned campaigning. She didn't rely on any institutions to come in and save her. She didn't have messaging experts. She knocked on 10,000 doors in one summer. And I'm not saying that's what everybody has to do. But, like, there is a there's a science to politics that we've somehow kind of been like, oh, let's take that and throw that out. Let's do all this other stuff and then blame all the other stuff right. when we lose. I would and, not be in office if it were not for that. That's you. Because that's you. Everyone, the Democratic establishment wrote me off. They're like, this guy's not even from Philly. He didn't he didn't kiss the right rings. You know, who does he think he is? Nobody knows who he is. He can't win. He cannot win. And I knocked on doors and I leveraged my uh, then aggressively adorable children uh, at the doors with me. You know, I did whatever I could. Like, these are my babies. They vouch for me. And um, there, there's no substitute for that. I said, look, don't. I'm not asking for your vote. I'm just introducing myself to you. you. Ask around, you know, see, kick the tires, see if I'm worthy of your vote on Tuesday. And um, that worked because everyone had taken their votes for granted. People hadn't knocked on their doors in years. And it's a high voter turnout district that I represent. Now, I will say that um, mm -hmm. I agree that the framing was, it was not ideal. I, I don't know Buffalo politics, but I can say that this this uh, this fellow who got reelected may be awful, but that doesn't make him a Republican. It's not like Republicans have a monopoly on awfulness. What he is apparently <laughs> right. is is a centrist um, establishment person who who embraces the status quo no matter what, and that is no less problematic. We don't need the Trump boogeyman to to inform 
uh, concerned uh, voters and citizens, hey, we the last thing we need is more status quo. We need to shake things up in a meaningful way. And uh, that's that's really, really important. And I think when we get off um, what what our values are as candidates, um, we we get ourselves dirty and then we get distracted into all this other stuff. And I think ultimately, what is your vision and why are you fighting and, and why are people um, trying so hard to keep you out of office and people pay attention? I said, our, when I ran first, I said the first time I said, candidates should be elected, not selected. And mm. I ran against somebody mm. who was supposed to walk in through a coronation through the Democratic establishment and people and it really resonated with folks because no one wants to feel like they've been taken advantage of or ignored. And that opened up their their ears to me. And they're like, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm going to listen to him because I agree. I don't like being taken yeah. for granted. This was not a field margin, though. So I do want to be clear about that. This was a much bigger than field margin victory. Oh, and yeah, so I do explain, think your question for, becomes for folks, huge. Wait, wait, wait. People may not know what that means. So can you just, just define Which, what a field margin is? You know, the is? number uh, of percentage points, usually less than, than five, uh, that you can actually just hustle to get. It's like yeah. if we squeezed every lemon to get all the juice out, knocked on every door, hit every block, uh, what is the farthest we can rise from that? But this is actually a structural kind of cultural problem in, you know, not to be snooty about it, y'all's party. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I think, I mean, I do know Buffalo, um, sadly, and that's where my mom was in office to make it clear when I put the two things together. Um, there's, there was a lot of like downstate, let's come up here and help you out to this. And I'm not saying that there weren't Buffalonians who were helping. There were plenty of DSA members and I want to give them a lot of credit because that like helped facilitate and nurture this. But you felt it felt more field trip than organic volunteers. Yes, a hundred percent. The messaging, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a factory town. And you're like, you're like pulling New York City kind of edginess. Cappuccino you know, glasses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was very and like, you know, and I get that there were some people from downstate that came up to endorse, but that doesn't mean anything. That was performative for them. I mean, I love my senator, my state senator. I I really and he went out here and campaigned for her, but like nobody <laughs> Like, right, nobody gonna, knows you. Nobody knows who you are, dude. Like, it's yeah, not, yeah, yeah, like, you're yeah, only yeah, helping. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're knocking on doors and you're next Let's year. get like the local, like, union reps. Let's get yeah. the real folks around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, and the messaging. I think so, like, when you add all these things up, um, and, and part of that, I think, is because, you know, she's a first-time candidate and um, she might have been taking cues from people who were, as you would, like, if you don't, if you've never done this before, I mean, I've been in that situation. You just yeah. get advice from everyone. You're like, sure, this sounds great. I trust you guys. You've gotten people elected. And it's not a city council race. She's running for mayor at some point. You know what I mean? It's like you can't just fall flat on your face. There's too many people counting on you just as the Democratic nominee. Yeah. You know, because, again, people thought that that meant something. Yeah. She's. I, I want to reiterate this. She's extraordinary. Like, I hope she runs. I don't know. I hope she runs again. I don't know what she runs for, but I hope she runs again because she's really a dynamic person that like you don't you know it's hard to find those kinds of candidates but again like how do we as as a movement because it's we can't just say it's the democrats fault i think we have to figure out the democrats are going to democrat how are we as progressives going to outsmart in these little instances and sometimes it's like one move two moves and yeah. and we could have done it I just do feel an echo of the whole infrastructure reconciliation bill, though, which is that no, we don't, we as progressives don't know what the centrists want, even, you know, like yeah, they want money. And, and yeah, <laughs> and they're being very included about it. And so I do think it's like somehow uncovering that has to be at the center of a kind of a communications campaign okay, so, on it. So, because so it's this, this being able to just sort of delay and mysterious and I don't know, and maybe next week we'll think about it. That's what's killing everybody, right? Let's let's play this clip because I'm I'm glad you say that. Um, last night on CNN, uh, Van Jones, oh yeah, had some thoughts uh, um, about about the Democrats and and what people think about them and how they're acting. Let's play the clip. Much motion, such in such a short period of time, and so I think Democrats have to look in the mirror now because the New Jersey situation, you don't have a bunch of critical race theory stuff there. You don't have a bunch of it's Dr. false. Trump, you don't have That's also absolutely false. Totally, totally false. false. He's never been to New Jersey. There's, there's exactly. something happening out here. It could be just anti-incumbent. I think that's a part of it. I but I think that there's something else that's happening. I think that I think that Democrats are coming across in ways that we don't recognize that are annoying and offensive um, and seem out of touch 
in ways that I don't think show up in our feeds when we're looking at, at, at our kind of echo chamber. And I think that this is a message here because uh, Scott was describing a go. Oh, when you're talking about our, you're talking about Democrats. Democrats yes. it, it seems annoying to a lot of people. Well, <laughs> well I'm just, I'm just saying. Okay, so just straight off, um, I, Arun and I both go, have you ever been in New Jersey? <laughs> it actually was critical race theory there, too. It's extremely Trumpian. A very good friend of mine was an advisor on that Phil Murphy race. I just want to throw, throw out one thing. I did not support Phil Murphy when he ran, but I have to say I have been pleasantly He's done his thing, yeah. He's been somebody who was a CEO of a, of a bank or Wall Street, whatever it was. Um, He's been much, much more responsive to the pandemic, progressive, and I really didn't expect it. With that being said, there are absolutely Trump people in New Jersey. That is yeah. like the Trump hive mind. Yeah, yeah. No, there's like a belt from Queens through Jersey that is sort of the outer borough uh, racism, uh, Archie Island. Bunker kind of, you know, <laughs> that sort of feels, it feels about right, you know? Yeah. Um. So yeah, rep rap. I, I there's a lot to debunk there, but is it just because Democrats? I don't know which Democrats are annoying. <laughs> no, I, I I think that I think that um, white suburbanites are very fickle. Mm. I th I think you're right. That's and probably. I think, you're like, that's the and, whole answer. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I can also say that the Democratic Party never invests enough in black folk. Of course. And yeah. uh, so in, in Pennsylvania, we elect all of our judges. So we had a, a Supreme Court, Commonwealth, Superior Court races. All the Democrats appear to have lost statewide, all of them. Now, at the top of the ticket was a candidate for state Supreme Court, a um, um, uh, white woman from uh, Philly. Um, who has a long track record um, as uh, assistant DA for one of the, the most racist and brutal DAs in Philadelphia history. Um, she was put up in front of <laughs> which is actually quite black a list. Woman. I know. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. She, uh, there was a, a black woman who's on the court with her on superior court who was um, uh, going to run and the democratic machine bullied her from, from yeah. running. And I believe that if she ran, more pro even even though she's more progressive as a black woman from Philadelphia with a more powerful story, more charismatic and certainly no less competent um, a jurist, um, she could have gotten the 125,000 votes more that she would have needed to, to beat the Republican because her story, her approach, her background could have engaged um, uh, black Democrats who, who stayed at home in Philly and beyond um, because the Democratic Party uh, took them for granted, and because the the Democratic machine in Philadelphia does not know how to turn out their voters, they haven't in generations. Which is the purpose of the machine? So it's yeah, like it's like you're purpose. running your car, but there's no wheels, and you're just have the exhaust going. You're like, eh, exactly. I'm just burning some oil. You're like, exactly. it's not a car. What do you? What so is this? It's a slush fund. And, but it's <laughs> yeah. worse because now we have yeah. um, the so-called consensus um, uh, candidate for governor, Josh Shapiro, who is our current Democratic. Uh, attorney yeah. general who is beloved by law enforcement um and um is seeking to be a transformative leader but he just said he opposes the democratic governor's push for pennsylvania to join the regional greenhouse gas initiative or reggie which new york is a part of all the northeast states uh what? pennsylvania would be the 12th and it, it freaked people out like wait he's now against us joining reggie at and he's doing it because of the trade unions. Yeah. The trade unions are opposed to this because uh, they believe yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah, kill yeah. jobs. And um, they're not intersectional. They don't, they're not talking about environmental justice or environmental racism. They're not talking about climate action. They're not talking about green collar jobs. They're not talking about any of these things. No, no, it's that pipeline. It has 10,000 people can work on that pipeline. Yeah, yeah. Right. Can and most of them are not from Pennsylvania. And most of them aren't going to be from Philly. And none of them nope. are permanent jobs. Of course. And, and, but it's, you know, it's a contract. And so, you know, they're thinking very short term. Um, I want to play this other clip, uh, continuing the theme of, of Democrats like messaging. And I mean, I think Van Jones is right. Uh, Democrats messaging has been off, but I would say the whiny ones are the fascists that we put on TV and have no problem normalizing. Just my thought. But what happens when you do that is it eases in, as you just said, Rep Rab, into Democratic talking points because 
when you're not defending, they're joining them. It's 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 when they're not on defense, they're joining them. There's no alternative message. It's not like they can come up with their own message. So let's play Terry McAuliffe because uh, that was a wipeout also last night. No surprise. And at the same time, I also believe that while I'm, you know, while voters worry about the day-to-day uh, economic issues, they're being browbeat in saying that if you don't support these Democrats, if you decide to go with the Republican in Virginia, then you're you're voting for racists. You're voting for white supremacists. You're essentially voting for Donald Trump all over again. And people out there do not believe that about themselves. They do not want to be told that about themselves. And I don't think they fundamentally believe that America is full of the hateful kind of people that McAuliffe and Biden and the rest told us that Virginia was full of. And they rejected that today. And I think Democrats are going to have a difficult election if they continue to paint America in such a negative light when Republicans fundamentally are going to say, look, we're good people. We all want the same thing, but we that's have fair. an issue set that will appeal. I, I think that's, I that's fair enough, but what I, what I will say is this. Fair Part enough. Of these- okay. Let's just start off with, I don't remember Joe Biden and Terry McAuliffe ever getting up and being like, y'all are a bunch of racists. Yeah, Terry McAuliffe? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Pretty sure that wasn't, yeah, in their top but, 400 so, strategy uh, points. So when, when will Democrats realize that maybe going after uh, a, a rich white um, corporate dem candidate is not the best move. When 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 when, when well, will there's that? There's a lot of money to be made, Rep. Rab, and like if they can get it within the margin, uh, you know. And listen, Terry McAuliffe, he was the governor, so it's like he just walks in. He's always friendly. He's always drinking. It's kind of his thing, guys. You know. I do want right, to so say there was, was also what was the margin of error. What was what was the margin of victory? I don't know. What's the final? Do we have that? Uh, it was a couple of points yeah. when I saw it last, but I, I don't know the final. The so final New Jersey was people? a point? Or? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, not, not even. It's still. Yeah. It's it's still 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 it's, it's like 5,000 votes. That, 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 These elections uh, all get longer, don't they? As our technology yes, gets do. better, somehow the elections get longer. It doesn't yes. totally make sense. you know. But 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 my point is, what what is the cost of having uh, a mediocre, albeit well-known, but mediocre candidate running who does not energize the base. The base stays at home, and the yeah. base is the if for the Democratic Party is the is the demographic that's closest to the pain, and that's Oof. that's black folk. That's good. closest to the pain. Love that, right? So, you know, what is it going to take? And I think you talked about the political industrial complex, uh, Nomi, because right, that's. That's what's uh, pushing forth the can- kind of candidates we have to. It's a it's a two handed boat, you know, one on the ballot and one pinching our nose, right? Uh, yeah. Because the <laughs> industry has has pushed that out because they can, you know, build those candidates for a lot of money, and I understand that. But at what point are we going to say, you know, it it makes more sense to invest in the base because when you ask black folk to come out to vote, you don't have to tell them who to vote for because we're smart enough to know. <laughs> it's like, well, should I vote for this person? We we know, but we have to be, uh, you know, we have to be asked. We have to be motivated, engaged, yeah. motivated, right? And and we're not. And all of these all these races, it's not like they're not enough registered Democrats right. to prevail. And when you look at the people who chose to stay home, they're closest to the pain, so they would have the most to lose, and yet they still don't show up. Are we going to then? Um, Blame them and say, how dare you not support this mediocre candidate um, who is just doing everything wrong? Or are you going to say, how can we reinvest in meaningful ways? And I know that sounds idealistic because that's not what the Democratic Party does. But I'm really talking to all those people who are, who are not deeply allied with a party, but are more connected to progressive values. And, and, progressive and doing values it in between more elections. Mo- mainstream. Exactly. And that's what, what's happening in Pennsylvania because we have yeah. the new Pennsylvania project. That's loosely modeled off of, you know, Georgia Georgia. Mm -hmm. and um, that's got getting off the ground. And I'm hoping they can provide this great leadership under Kadita Kenner. And I'm hoping they can provide that leadership and that example so that the Democratic Party can learn from them. Because because I mean, there is I I guess I have some friends who worked on Murphy's campaign and progressive friends, strangely enough. But um, one uh, person in particular was she's she's extraordinary uh, handled black outreach and she's very good at her job. And like turns people out and, but her same complaint it every cycle. It's just, 
you have to open. It's like you have to build the house again and then take it down after the election. But wouldn't it be mm-hmm. great if the plot of land was cleared? There was some sort of we were just building yep. floors up on the house rather than building it from scratch every single election. And it's not because, like you said, like people know who to vote for. When you're closest to you know to the ground and you're feeling the pain, you know who to vote for. It's hard. We have institutional barriers for people to turn around. You're working, you, your mother. It is hard. And so if every election you're putting all this energy in into turning out, you're not seeing the results. But also you may not even be understanding. I don't know if all voters understand like who that Republican is and how dangerous they are. I mean, the guy in Virginia is horrifying, horrifying. But what yeah. he was able to do was mobilize no the worst voters out there while we like, cause you gotta, you gotta match it. You gotta match the energy. You don't match fascist with toast. Like, you know what I mean? I, I, I hate to be, it's not, it's not, it's not hard. It's not, it's simple. It's simple. And we all know that. And that's why I think we're all at a loss of words and frustrated. It's like, we're beating a dead donkey over and over <laughs> yeah. again. Yeah. And you know, I, I I'm just going to say what it is. It's racist. Of course it is. Yeah. But but it, it, it's the open secret. And um, when you know that if um, the base came out and you, it, it, you have to acknowledge that the, the, the last remaining loyal base of the Democratic Party is black folk. Mm-hmm. And with I don't know who's a distant second. I don't know who's a distant second. But black folk. If you don't invest in black folk, you don't win elections. And they continue to, to divest. That is racist. And I, I don't care what they say about Black Lives Matter. I don't care. Who right, right. Are. It's ultimately um, the proof is in the pudding. And I, I'm tired of it as a black registered Democrat. I feel like I don't have a home. Mm. And I feel as though... Um, um, <laughs> that some real changes are going to have to happen and it never happens from the top. And that's, that's actually a good thing. Um, but people need to, to connect the dots and um, we can't get that from corporate media, which is why I always love your show and um, independent journalists and activists who are taking to their platforms to, to connect the dots for folks. Final thoughts run from uh, Lithuania. What can we learn from the Lithuanian people? Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, they're actually having <laughs> having some interesting problems here right Do, now. Isn't, but isn't every last name in Lithuania, sorry, I just need a little moment of clarity. Isn't is it's like E S K K E S? Don't isn't that the the country where a lot of people have eskies cuz they always confuse that with Greek. And people always say, no, I'm Lithuanian. Not is Greek, that Estonian or Lithuanian? It's one of them. Maybe, maybe I don't know maybe it's Lithuanian. I think, I and I think about okay, it. then it's probably Lithuania. Uh, Just watch. Then, then I believe that comes in. No, the thing that I that I want to say is, you know, sometimes we are looking for these sort of uh, perfect answers when we do have to acknowledge also the general swing of politics that has been true mm-hmm. in every parliamentary bicameral chamber system. Like there is a natural swinging of the pendulum. And so we have to sort of stop acting so befuddled when we know it's going to be hard, right? right? So you're talking about like making a choice. It's like you knew Virginia was going to be hard. It doesn't matter that it wasn't for 16 years. You knew the pendulum had to come back at some point. You knew you had a racist as crap governor uh, who couldn't remember if he was the Klan guy (laughs) or the guy in blackface, right? Like you're talking about black people being motivated to come out. You knew you had a rapist lieutenant governor. Like no prices were paid for any of this. Like, so it's just like some of these things, they're just, it's like sort of Chinese medicine, right? It says about your body. Like it's just inflammation, but it attacks you where you're naturally weakest, so there's mm. just things, something that, that that's wrong and rotten. And so, yeah, you lose for this reason, that reason, and we analyze it. But no, you lose because you were going to lose. Like, you know, because you were headed for failure and you were headed for loss. And sometimes I get frustrated that sort of people sort of can't see that, right? Like, it's like, there's no cruising through to victory on this one. You're going to have to scrap it out and it's not going to be fun. And even when you win, people are going to be like, yeah, you barely won. And you're going to have to be happy with that, with that narrative. Rep, Rep, final thoughts? I think we can learn a lot more from the people who chose to stay at home than mm. um, the folks who showed up and vote, voted for whomever. I think let's that's the them. real story. Yes, that's right. And like you said, what happens in between elections is vastly more important than what happens during. Because that's when you build those relationships. That's where you get 
the intel. You listen to folks. And mm-hmm. anything short of that is just the Wall Streetification of the electoral process, where you only look at quarter to quarter to quarter. And That's right. it has infected every aspect of society. Um, yeah. As much as some ads can be brilliant, sorry, Arun, I have no relationship with what any of the ads. I have a relationship with my neighbor and the people around me and hopefully, and, and my elected official, I have loyalty to my elected officials because I know them. Not because of me, but, but I know them. And I think a lot of us, you know, many of us who have that opportunity, it makes a huge difference. And that's what your conference is, is like building relationships. It's human nature. Um, all right, guys, this was very productive. We've solved all the problems. Let's put yeah. together a plan. Um, and then let's propose it. And then let's uh, raise money and create an organization and make this happen. I'm kidding. <laughs> all right. Really good conversation. Rep Rab, good luck in Tampa. Uh, Arun, good luck in Lithuania. I'll see you. I will be in Puerto Rico this weekend for a political conference called Somos. So ah, excellent. I might see you next week um, to report back from my political conference because this is a special. You know, I just got to say we do something a little special in our little community. All the- a lot of shows on TV too, but I think more online have a, a lot of pundits who don't necessarily always, you know, they'll have authors on, and that's great. But we bring people on who are like in politics. And that's what they do on cable news, too. It's like Van Jones has an organizing background. David Axelrod obviously was in politics, but they're in the wrong side. So I think it's really important for us to have people who are doing the good work and have the experience to, 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 to guide people um, the right way. So thank you for, for doing this and showing up. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Uh, COP26 is underway right now. COP26. Uh, is the conference of people, and it is about saving this planet or what's left of it. Uh, how to let go of all things and love what we. Have. I'm kidding. Josh Fox is joining us. Josh. Josh knows the joke. Uh, Josh Fox is a filmmaker, of course. He's an Oscar-nominated filmmaker. He is an activist. Uh, he is my comrade in so many ways through so many fights. Josh is on the streets of New York right now, no better place on the planet to be. Uh, he actually, the, the thing, the, the joke I was making is he directed and wrote The Truth Has Changed, Gasland, Gasland 2, Awake, and How to Let Go of the World and Love Things and love all things that climate can't change. I think that's the actual title. When he was promoting this, we would hang out every, I would change the title every single time. Uh, let's bring Josh Fox in. All right. I'm I actually your, I'm, I'm your man on the street. It's as if I was at COP, um, Just but I'm say. not because they didn't invite me to COP, which is really annoying. Well, you're it's not a world 20, leader. I, I got to say. time in a row. No, actually that's not oh, That's true. true. Actually, um, great segue. I, there, 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 we, I am a world leader, and uh, so are you. Um, and we, we need leadership from all different corners right now. And what's really frustrating about the COP, which is the conference of the parties. Could they have come up with a better... Uh, I, would believe, I would believe I am a party. Uh, <laughs> is that the anti-fracking movement, of which I am one of many leaders. Yeah. There are many, many leaders, but I'm certainly one of them. Um, that, that the anti-fracking movement is absolutely quintessential, essential to solving the problem of climate change, uh, and yet we're ignored every single time out the gate. I don't know of a single cop which has invited a a major anti-fracking leader from any continent to talk about why it's so important to both stop oil production, stop drilling, stop gas production, stop polluting our atmosphere, and stop what is the fastest rising source of greenhouse gas emissions in the world, which is fracking. Um, So so it's interesting you say this because I'm... It's actually a great segue because you know who was invited to um, COP26, who is yes, now a world I'm leader. And, and I actually think this is, I mean, I know people, I came out, I was at a climate conference, as you know, two weeks ago, and there was a lot of protests against um, the the CEO of Shell and, uh, and an, an executive from Amazon, a high up executive, in which I took part in these protests too. Um, but it's not just that these folks are invited. It's that I actually think the premise of the conversations, whether at COP26 or previous COPs or, or at these, these other climate summits, is they really believe that the solution is going to come through big industry because they're intertwined in every single aspect of our lives rather than true, hardy regulation, which, of course, we understand. So um, what does that mean? Jeff Bezos, the, the, the evil... <laughs> 
the evil man. Um, it's insane. It's just insane spoke that COP they would 26. invite Jeff Bezos to COP. Yes. So Jeff to Bezos. Speak. To speak. To speak. Went to COP26. Um, and he, this is Sam Knight's tweet, uh, and I will continue to read. He lectured people whose countries are sinking and whose citizens are dying on the, quote, fragility of the natural world, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I think they know, mate. But apparently, we should be very grateful because he is going to spend a fraction of the money he doesn't pay in taxes on restoring nature. Remember, every billionaire is a policy failure. Pay your tax and get off the stage. So this, <laughs> what we're going to do after this that. is we're going to play this a clip of, of me, I'm, it's not about me, but like this was the message we took to the Amazon executive at the other conference. They are making a concerted effort as they're being pushed to pay taxes, as they're being dragged in the press, as the, the you know as the boogeyman, as they're going off into space on our you know subsidized by the American people. They think, okay, I'm going to go to a conference and do this. My, my press people told me, this is not an accident. It's not just that he was invited. It's that there is a comms team there saying, this is the strategy. This is the new greenwashing. The problem is we don't have fucking time. There's no time for greenwashing. It's, like, so, it's, it's like having Charles Manson speak at a peace rally. You know what I mean? It's, this is like having, some good ideas, see, this is like having Idi Amin speak at like a cooking conference. cooking conference you know what i mean this is like having you know i don't even know what to say what this is like this is like ha having a pole pot you know <laughs> speak at uh, you know uh, imagine the world was a good place conference or whatever the, this is really this is fun like just keep going having ren and stimpy speak at a conference of dentists I, it's just the most inappropriate <laughs> thing i could ever imagine to have jeff bezos Jeff motherfucking Bezos is the, one of the most carbon intensive humans right. on the planet. There in is so many so, ways. the man himself his company, is responsible, the jet not just himself. for his company, but his own like yes. penis rocket is like a, a, a the giant dildo that he <laughs> shoots up into space every once in a while. Um, you know, it ejaculates behind him <laughs> an enormous cloud of world killing carbon. This man is insane. He's, he's not just, it's, listen, it's not just that he's, a, he's, the, he's like a super villain on a whole nother level, right? That's not the only issue. It, it, the man looks, sounds, feels, and probably smells like Lex Luthor. But let's just say, you know, the, the super villain from yes. Superman. Um, but, I think, I think people Bezos, got that reference over Pol Pot. I was going to say, more so. Bezos, um, he, he's absolutely actually clearly clinically mad he said after his first space flight something that not many people took note of that we should move all polluting industries into space how does that even he, work well, well okay he said he, we should move all polluting industries into space also he has created something called blue origin which is this is the first phase which is a giant million person centrifuge that floats above the planet where every single thing is controlled. You're like living literally in a spinning terrarium and he thinks people would like to live there. Of course, there is something that's a lot like that, which is called Seattle, but <laughs> the, the, the spinning terrarium in the sky um, is like the Jeff Bezos author ultra-totalitarian ultra universe in which every need is, supply, is supplied by Jeff Bezos. And, and he's floating it's above the earth in a Wally. -E. This, this is like literally the city on in Wally. -E. Um, and, and, and we're all going to get there because we're never going to have to leave the house ever, ever, ever. And everything will be delivered to our door. We'll become enormously fat and boneless. And Jeff Bezos will be the only thing left as this giant penis floating. Well, through the here's my that theory his, on this. That is his vision. I don't even. So think having this, this man being a cop has completely devalued yeah. the entire fucking undertaking. In my but opinion. Josh, I don't even think it's about shipping people, or I guess not shipping, jetting people to to space. You know, the chosen few, and that might be true. But I think it's about the workforce. Like he said, offsetting carbon to space, meaning they nope. get to keep Earth. Because uh, can you imagine a planet like, like the, this is Elon all Musk also. Polluting industry, all polluting industry. All polluting. Meaning we're going we're gonna to somehow put coal mining in space. We're going to no, somehow I, that, put the yeah. auto manufacturing in space. We're going to somehow put Bitcoin mining in space. We're going yeah. to somehow put, I guess, Jeff Bezos in space. 
I mean, well, so, uh, and, but I don't think that's true. I, I, I he might be saying that. Put every New York City diesel bus in, in space. space. Like, what is Someone's happening? right behind you. What is the man talking about? It's insane. Sure. Well, okay. Then you've got Elon Musk, and I don't know if we can find that tweet. We can put it up on screen um, later. But then Elon Musk, of course, said the same thing, saying, okay, well, I will – he basically was like, I'm happy to send people to space, uh, humankind to Mars to live. But the reality is, okay, these are, these are guys with a lot of money. They, 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 they know math. They know math because they get mad when $380 trillion – you know, they, they don't they don't want to make that much money. They want to make three hundred and ninety trillion dollars. They want to pay ten trillion dollars in taxes. This is all funny money, obviously. But they understand math because they're looking at their bank accounts and how much they're making a day. But somehow they don't understand how many humans there are on the planet. They don't understand environmental math. They don't understand science and oxygen and how much time it takes to get to Mars and back. They don't I, this is all an, this is a joke. And what I think this is Our really system. about is they want Earth. And they want us off of it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that human beings can't live on Mars. Um, the atmosphere <laughs> is too thin. Thank you, Josh. To create, to, to uh, 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 after a few years, even if you were going to make it a few years on Mars, which would be very, very difficult to do, I think it would be psychologically like a torture. But human beings literally cannot survive Mars because there's no atmosphere to block out this harmful solar radiation which will give you cancer and kill you and destroy your immune system. I mean, there's right. like our atmosphere um, prohibits a lot of very harmful solar radiation from raining down onto the planet, right. which uh, enables human life to happen and not just human life, but a, a lot of other life. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is like, let's just, I thought we were going to talk about climate change, but I'm fine with talking. Yeah, about this it. is fun. Um, so, the bottom Josh, line is that being a billionaire, a billionaire, being a billionaire is a mental illness. It's like being a hoarder. Um, we look at those people who, in their hoarding apartments with their like giant news, every newspaper they've ever had since 1978, and like all their gum wrappers and everything. And we look at them and it's like clear, oh, obviously insane. Needs something. Needs medication. Needs help. Needs you know, now. Mental illness is nothing bad. Mental illness is something that we all, many of us, struggle with. And mental illness is something that shouldn't be taboo. But mental illness is also something we should strive to cure, and strive to uh, ameliorate. And in the case of the mental illness of the billionaires, what they are is they're this, these hoarders of wealth. Uh, they have a, this incredible ego problem, which is that there's a hole so deep in these people that nothing can fill it. And they keep trying to fill it and fill it and fill it and fill it and fill it. It's like an addict with money. And there's no way to do this. So the money doesn't work as, uh, oh, uh, so it must be power. These are very dangerous people. Because they're, they're dangerous on, on a level because there's no way to ever make them feel human. There's no way to make them ever feel good. And, and if you look at Jeff Bezos and you look at Elon Musk, they are the, uh, they're like this perpetual want machine unfolding in front of you. And it's really, really sad. But what's most sad about it is that our system is designed to create those people. Our system holds those people at the pinnacle. So our system is mentally ill. Our system is one of psychotic behavior, and our system is one where we don't, um, we, we, we uh, have separated the individual to such a degree that we cannot uh, process what it is to either be a part of a community or be a part of the planet Earth. The fact of the matter is, human beings are not separate from the planet Earth. Of course. We are a part of the planet Earth. We are not a part of planet Mars. Um, we are a part of the planet Earth. They can't even go to like Oklahoma City and they want to go to Mars. I mean, they can't even stand. It's, it's, it's what do you mean they can't go to Oklahoma they City? They can't like hang out in Tampa and they want to go to Mars. Like, come I can't on, guys. Hang out in Tampa either. But we don't want to go to Mars. <laughs> I think Mars might be a step up from Tampa. Um, but, you know, that's just me. At least Obviously, there's beachfront so, property in Tampa. Well, uh, yeah. Um, uh, property, but well, I guess that we don't the, have access the, to. The issue yeah, I mean. is that that uh, these people are the bane of our existence. I'm yeah. Literally, the bane of our literally, existence. literally at this point. Um, and what Jeff Bezos is doing, and I just want to be really clear about this. As let's move back to the. Uh, this is yeah because there's because there Jeff is a Bezos link here. Is, has pledged to give ten billion dollars to environmental quote unquote environmental organizations, climate change. His choice. 
over the next several years. I don't know how, what the type of is. Ten billion dollars uh, to give to those uh, environmental organizations, presumably to stop climate change. Now, that's the idea, right? But no, what did Jeff Bezos do when he wanted to consolidate the publishing market? He started giving out grants to publishers, to small publishers. He bought them all off. Now, they could have created an opposition to him. They could have created a united front. All those small publishers and small publishing houses and bookstores and all those places could have actually rallied to try to get Amazon broken apart to invoke mm -hmm. antitrust laws. But instead, he very smartly bought the entire field, bought it. And, what and then what happens now, with that is a perspective shifts. I mean, oh, yeah. you know more than anybody that it's not just taking the money. And I say this yeah. all the time when we're talking about institutions on the left, which is the beginning of the show. I said, you have to follow the money. We have institutions on the left that have recently taken money from people that you'd be really surprised by. And it mm -hmm. affects – it doesn't mean that the people working at these organizations aren't good-hearted. They just – when there's a monopoly, when there are only so many institutions out there really fighting climate change and paying wages – there's an agenda that comes with that, and there's stuff oh, that is taken off the plate. There's language that has it's to shift. It's a corrupting shift. influence. It's a corrupting it's and coercive influence. But besides that, like, so Jeff Bezos is going to give $10 billion to environmental organizations, right? But Which the ones? real reason is because you can't fucking go to Mars. You can't build a space program on Earth without fossil fuels. You right. cannot. So he's trying to make sure that these people do not get in his way. He wants to go to Mars... He wants to, 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 to build this incredible, weird, wall-e centrifuge in the sky called Blue Origin, which he thinks somehow a million people will want to live there. Although, I have to say, uh, Tampa and the Wally thing sound very similar to me. But the, the bottom line is that like, he wants to uh, buy off the environmental organizations so that they can't get in his way. And this is extremely, extremely dangerous. Now, I'm going to call some people out right now. Because this is unbelievable. Number one, NRDC, the National Resource Defense Council, who were not anti-fracking, who got in our way when we were trying to ban fracking in New York State. When we got in our way, we were trying to ban fracking in Illinois. NRDC, $100 million from Jeff Bezos. Um, Environmental Defense Fund, EDF, not an environmental organization, a, um, a basically an apologist for the fossil fuel industry, uh, got in our way when we were trying to ban fracking in Texas and a lot of other places, $100 million. From Jeff Bezos. Now, now, mind you, this is still only a hundred million at the time, right? So we're talking about this. There's more. He only gave away um, a billion so far. Uh, and, and the worst part of this for me is the Solutions Project, which is an organization that I founded. The Solutions Project, the very first organization to premiere the idea of 100% renewable energy on the planet, founded by myself, Marco Kraples, Mark Jacobson, and Mark Ruffalo, um, all of whom myself, the grassroots leader, uh, Mark. Marco Kraples, the uh, renewable energy banker, Mark Jacobson, the scientist, all of whom were systematically eliminated from the organization, leaving only Mark Ruffalo um, and a whole bunch of other people out there who like to say nice things to Mark Ruffalo, uh, has taken 50 million fucking dollars from Jeff Bezos. And what those 50 million dollars are going to do is they're going to create small grants for climate activists of color. Now, I uh, when I mentioned this to one of my associates, who was also a person of color, she said, that's the evilest thing I can imagine. And well, I, explain that. well, because now you have a whole generation of activists who are beholden to and thankful for Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Now, and, and there's conditions, too. I, so if you're training activists. I don't know activists, there's conditions. I don't know what the deal is. Of course there are. I, you and this I has to be called out. This, this has yeah. to be called out. You cannot simply buy the movement. Now, it's a really important thing to do to give money to people of color activists in the climate space. No question. No yep. question. But, but, but what, are the mo what is the motivation right now? What is the motivation right now? The motivation is, um, I think I have to get into a, into a car right now. Um, the That's motivation. Okay. Sorry. I'll ask you a question um, while you're doing this. The motivation, my bad. Take my hand. I'm sorry, I'm getting it. The no, I love it. This is, is not <laughs> to solve the climate problem. The motivation is to co-opt the all That's the right. entire movement. That's the motivation. And I I know as a person who runs an organization, when someone who offers you a huge amount of money, um, it is you think it's going to be very useful to you, and it probably will be. Make sure you wear your seatbelt. Um, to your mission. But what comes along with that? What comes along with that? 
I mean, I, my whole life, my whole claim to fame or whatever is that I didn't take the money from the gas industry, right? I didn't take the money. I decided that I wasn't going to sell my soul to frack the Delaware River Basin. Mm -hmm. And I would also posit one other thing, which is a very, very difficult thing to say. Money is good for organizations. Money is often good for people. But money is not good for movements. It's not good for ideas either. Money is not good for movements. Movements need to have a different currency. Yeah, and we have to focus on what the different currency is. Movements have to have togetherness. Movements have to have fight. Movements have to have um, have have of have, have mission. Have to have backs against the wall. But like, I I don't believe that the money that went to Standing Rock ended up making that movement stronger. No, you're right. I and, don't and, believe. I, I think the people who showed up at Standing Rock made that movement stronger. I think the mutual aid that I was going to say mutual Rock aid that, is important. That yes. movement stronger, but the the dollars, the money in people's bank accounts, I don't think it did, and I don't think it made the anti fracking movement stronger either. Um, you know, so money and movements are, are, are at, at odds with each other. They're not money and organizations are not. Organizations need money. Organizations need. Um, you know what I'm trying to say? There's a difference no, I, I know exactly what between you're so, organizing so me, and organization. Let me break this down just a little for folks because, I mean, both of us run organizations and understand this in a, and have been part of the movement in different ways. Mm. Um, we talk about the show's kind of theme is about institutions on the left and what's happening and how we're not able to succeed. And, and I think the climate movement is a perfect example of this because when you become beholden to quarterly profits or quarterly margins, so two different... <laughs> industries, right? But same confines. Like if you're an organization, if you're a PAC, if you're a C4, if you're a C3, you know, the industrial complex is keep it, is, is what it takes to keep that alive. And if you're looking mm-hmm. for money in different ways, um, there's only so many places you can go because there's only so many rich people out there who care about that one issue. And oftentimes they will be looped into that that class, that industrial complex class, where they go to conferences and they hear ideas and and may not understand what's happening on the ground from the movement space. Now, if the movement suddenly thinks that they have to institutionalize, yeah, which is always what to happens. succeed, which is always what happens. Oh, we have this move. Let's turn into an organization. Um, uh, you know, that's where movements go to fail is through organizations. Doesn't mean that you can't. Uh, I love I love Sunrise. I love all these groups, but they're all taking money from places that you and I both know now are are not the purest folks in the world. Well, and the I mean, difference. There's... Hang on, hang on, because there's decentralized aspect of this. Sure. The difference between where we are now versus where we were six years ago mm-hmm. or five years ago mm-hmm. is that five years ago it was much easier to crowdsource. The mono- the same people who are making all of this money, who become billionaires overnight and are going to be trillionaires, are the same people and, and founders of these companies that are now making it more difficult for everyday people to raise money than what they could six years ago. That includes candidates, that includes mm. organizations, that yeah. includes movements. You That's and I both know we are not getting the hits that we got in 2016. No, it's true. That's and true. we were people that had names back then. Now, how mm-hmm. is somebody who's involved in a local movement going to do it? And so mm-hmm. their, their alternative is, all right, I have to, you know, I have to get a grant and we all get swept up in the system. Uh, but what you're saying is hundred percent, it's a sophisticated well, I, co-opting I, I, of it's, movements. Yeah. Well, right now that feels to be the case, yes. and there's a consolidation of power in in our in our uh, nonprofit space. There's a co- consolidation yeah. of power in our funding spaces, and there's a consolidation of power in our in our media, our media space yeah. as well. And all of those are not good for our for democracy. They're not good for people of power. They're not good for the for the revolution. I mean, I think all of it is actually a reaction to the political revolution that you and I are a part of that, um, that we has been so beautifully defined five years ago by Bernie Sanders. And I think that it has to find a new way to continue. Um, but what I'm seeing right now is very, very weird. Like when I look at the cop, I just find it so bizarre. I'm watching like, I'm I'm watching like Jeff Bezos speak on the inside of cop. I'm seeing friends of mine, like Maria, um, uh, Ina, uh, Ina Maria Chicago, who is trying to stop fracking in Namibia, 
a, an incredible African um, leader against fracking, uh, outside of COP, trying to figure out how to interact with it and protest it. And then I'm watching this insane punk rock band of like teenagers led by Greta Thunberg, like screaming, blah, 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 blah at the gates. But I don't see Fridays for Future and Greta Thun Thunberg proposing solutions other than um, blah, blah, blah. I don't see them well, taking that on. Really, that I think really, is a failing. I have to point can, this can out. I, no, I don't. Can I, I just want to. We also need to build an intergenerational movement. But I want to explain that to folks because the main way. So there's. It's yeah, so it's incredible better. to have the youth activism, but there's yeah. wisdom that comes with that. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of young people, I just had this conversation in Scotland with a group of youth activists is they had done this action. And I said, it feels great, right? It's exhilarating. Great. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now what is it? What are you going to do with it? Is it just for clicks? Cause it's well, almost like we've been conditioned and young people in particular, it's an adrenaline hit. Mm -hmm. It is an adrenaline oh, hit. Yeah. And we have to be honest about this. Is this about adrenaline hits and going viral and mm -hmm. getting, or is it about an actual policy? I well, see lawmakers of, in New York. You've got a job funding, as a lawmaker. You well, don't need to go and do a sit-in. That's for the of, movement. Yeah. Speaking of funding, you know, when, when we, are, we built, uh, through, you know, I, I helped build, but a lot of other folks, um, Americans Against Fracking, International Organizations Against Fracking, yep. that we were the flash in the pan, you know, 10 years ago. And we got some funding, not a huge amount of funding, but some. Um, and that helped us really build a sense of what we were doing and who we were. And, we, and, and our movement actually kept a, a hell of a lot of carbon in the ground. I mean, a hell of a lot. Ban on fracking in 12 countries in Europe, five different states yep. in the United States. Like, we're really talking about a huge amount of actual carbon and methane not entering the atmosphere because of our actions and a lot of places that were protected from the horrendous chemi chemicals and, and contamination of fracking. But um, so when all of a sudden now you see Sunrise and, this, and Fridays for Future and, 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 for, and youth movement come about, which I love, I absolute love. But what happened was, unfortunately, a, a, there was a, a wholesale changing of the guard, which mm -hmm. meant everything that was youth was in and everything that we had done 10 years ago was out and all of our funding disappeared. We don't get funding for that anymore, oh, even wow. though we're still running all the programs. Um, and uh, their funding went through the roof. And I called funders and I said, listen, you need to have both. You need to build an intergenerational movement. Um, because two years ago, we had 300, 400, 500,000 people in the streets of New York City uh, for, for, for Fridays for Future uh, school strike. And, um, uh, and this year, they had 300 people. Mm -hmm. I went. They had literally 300 people of the youth. And so there's a failure here um, when we don't have people working together. And the cop seems to have driven um, straight through. Hold on one second. Uh, mm -hmm. Hold on. Just go to the West Side Highway. Go straight. Just go straight. Um, the, 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 uh, or pull over. The, the, um, the, the cop has driven those divisions even further. Because what you have there is the quote unquote adults on the inside, the Fridays for Future kids on the outside screaming at, at, at that they can't like, you, you know, that everything that's happening inside the cop is bullshit, yeah. which is, I'm sure it's not. I'm sure there's things that are happening inside the cop that are not bullshit, that are amazing, that are great, that are people. Which we also have to be hard. aware of. And I, I, I had I'm that sure moment the other day. I was people like, working hard. And I mean, the people the leaders are throwing coins into a fountain. It's like the most ridiculous no, gesture. It's like, we actually... hope we can solve climate change. It's like, no, 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 you guys run the world. What do you mean you hope? Like, no. what, what's going on? So the cop is actually right now dividing people, but also the funding structure that we're talking about and, and, the, and the way in which um, uh, th 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 this is working um, is serving to divide us even further. And we have to be conscious and generous. We have to be conscious and generous that says in a way that says, um, you know, we want, I want to reach out to mm -hmm. the youth leaders. I've had a number of youth leaders on my program, uh, working directly with Fridays for future and that, but that reaching out has to go both ways. Um, we see Bill McKibben, uh, uh, starting this new organization called third wave, which is, um, uh, for older folks, right? People over 60. So Bill McKibben yeah. is trying to organize the over 60 David folks, Fenton. um, which is great. And, um, then there's the younger than, 20, I guess. I don't know what the Fridays for Future cutoff is. Um, but, but, yeah. but for us in the Gen X and the millennial world, um, we have to be reached out to on both si from both sides, and we have to do the reaching out to both sides. 
That is the most important thing that we can do right now because we have to build an organized front. And it can't be about money. It cannot be about Jeff Bezos. It cannot be about who's got this funding. It has to be about actions, actions and solidarity. It has to be about strikes. It has to be about civil disobedience. It has to be about getting our bodies in the streets. It has to be about doing all the things that organize for power. Um, because that's where we win. We win when we organize, we win when we're coherent, and we win when we're working together. Um, I wanna, but, I, I wanna, but the money is now currently dividing us, and so are some of these structures. I want to um, end with one little point, and, sure. and then we have to wrap. But um, So I was listening to Brian, you're a New Yorker, so WNYC is, is the NPR station in New York, and Brian Lehrer is a longtime host, and he had somebody on today, uh, you know, this is COP26 week, uh, uh-huh. he had a, a, a language expert <clears throat> from Southern California who specializes in climate language and messaging. Okay. And I, you know, they're doing call-in. I'm like, I'm not going to call-in, but I wanted to. I was like, no, I'll just talk about it with Josh instead. We'll do our own version of a call-in. Um, I, I, the entire premise of this conversation, I was like, are we in – Are we in 2004? Because if we're still arguing over climate, because we think we are going to convince people that climate change exists, they they, they approach, people are approaching climate change as an electoral thing and still thinking Mm. that they can move people like Joe Manchin if they just say, well, instead of saying global warming, we say climate change, but now we say climate crisis. No, we don't say climate crisis. We say climate emergency because it's not, people, people get it. The polling shows people get it. It's not about polling. It's not about voting. It is about action. It's about Mm -hmm. pressuring Joe Biden and, uh, you know, leaders around the world to do something that they know very well they don't need to be convinced about. They don't need protests on the streets to move them. And P.S., those protests aren't doing a damn thing. And so what I keep saying over and over is our strategy needs to change. Black Lives Matter showed up on the streets at record, you know, after the George Floyd protests. Uh, women showed up after the women's march. Climate actions happen worldwide. It is yeah. not moving the needle. We have mm. to do something different, and it's not getting bogged down into these like language debates. No, it's called do your job, Joe Biden. You want to protest something? Protest Joe Manchin, Chuck Schumer for holding everything up so we don't get to our goals. Chuck well, Schumer. I think it's an electoral strategy. I mean, I think honestly, this new, the, new, the United States Senate is one of the most corrosive and and, and interrupting and worse uh, bodies in terms of climate change in the world right now. I mean, honestly, you know, we have have 14 senators. We have 14 senators from North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Alaska, um, and uh, one other one uh, that represent less population than the county of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. That's insane. That, and those are, they're all Republicans. Mm -hmm. So, Joe Biden needs to make D.C. We need to get D.C. to be a state right away. They need to put the screws to Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema. But we, as a movement, we can't give up on the electoral strategy. You're seeing people like poop, like badmouth Joe Biden. Joe Biden, w- by the way, it w- is doing all the things that Bernie Sanders would have done right now. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. He's pushing the for actual climate action. But, but, but I got to no, 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 say, yeah, he is. But Josh... I, I, I have to disagree with you. I'm not defining. Joe, I'm not defending Joe him. Biden, what I'm saying is this we is what Joe Biden to needs to do. Wake He's got to be pushing mansion. You want Joe Biden? I don't care what Joe Biden stands for. His out, his scapegoat is Joe Manchin. Right. Joe Biden knows how the Senate works. Joe Biden cannot wait until the final moments to, oh, we just got paid family leave and, and our, uh, because of the loss yesterday. That's what just broke while we're on, on air right now. Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer need to do their jobs. And Chuck Schumer can't be like, oh, look at me, I'm progressive. I endorsed India Walden, which I have nothing to lose because I, no, you want to be progressive? Pull away his committee position. Yeah, for sure. Put him under investigation for insider. I mean, put this his is office literally in the basement. Yes. Put his office in the basement. That's right. But then what happens is Joe, <laughs> Bi- Joe, Joe Manchin just leaves the Democrats, but it which he can matter. do at any minute. Because even with the majority, we're not getting anything passed. But in a way, if Joe Bi- if Joe Manchin left the Democrats, it actually would be better for the Democrats in the midterms, to be honest. It would be. I'm sitting yeah. here thinking it might have been better off had we not won Georgia at this point. Because we need know. something to push against. And what's happening right now is it just seems like the Democrats are falling apart. But the bottom line is the Democrats have been fall- fallen apart for a very long time, as you and I well know. And we were trying to fix that problem. We were right. trying to make that better. And so it was Bernie. The bottom line is that, like, they have to. But one thing that's happening is it's very clear: Joe Manchin, Kristen Cinema, are 
obstructing this, and that means the set the centrists in the, in in our Senate are obstructing at real action in the United States. And it can't just be about let's oh we're going to go protest outside of his office. There needs to be an electoral strategy. Right. Elections work. Elections matter. We need to tip the balance so that we need to get DC statehood. We need to end the filibuster. We need to make sure that. Um, we have a, a much more equitable situation because the the system is working to defend private interests, yep. and that will murder the planet. That will murder the earth. And and we this American government was created to defend the wealthy. It always was. That's what the American Revolution was about. It was about. Um, a group of wealthy white landowners convincing the lower classes that freedom meant something. Freedom means nothing if you don't have any money. Freedom means nothing if you don't have a fucking planet. Freedom means nothing if you don't have, if you don't have health care. Freedom means nothing if you don't have clean air and clean water, right? So these people convinced, uh, uh, just as they're doing now, a lower class that yep. didn't have money, that didn't have property, that didn't have power to fight on their behalf. And they created a system that would make sure that that, would, that power was never going to get taken away from them. So I, that's I, what's problem right now. Our American system is perpetuating the myth that you can be free without be, being beholden to other people and that being beholden to the environment, which is insane. I want to end on one note quick, if we can. Um, sure. So this this came out today, but I, I think it, it, it's a great important, you know, you helped advise me on, on climate when I was running and I overly prepared. And then I walked on stage and I was around 17 candidates who like one was like the climate expert and his solution was like ban plastic straws. And I'm going, Oh, so I remember um, having these conversations with you. So there's a report saying that the menu for cop 26 delegates has come under fire for serving meat and dairy in almost 60% of its dishes. Uh, a, a spokesperson for Rebels Animal called called it like serving cigarettes at a lung cancer conference. Now, <laughs> I did, you know, the conference I was at, they it was totally vegan, which, you know, for me was great because I'm into that. But, you know, there is an industry. From, from that perspective, from the meat perspective, there is an industry effect, right? The, there, the rise of, of, of plant-based meals, is it's definitely impacted the industry without a doubt. Mm-hmm. With that being said, and it is a huge cause of emissions, right, uh, the, the meat industry. With that being said, can you just briefly explain to us how the individual pressure versus the regulation has become a tool of the oil and gas industry well, for decades? Uh, I don't want to zero in so much on vegans. I mean, there's, there's no. so many different kinds of vegans and vegetarians. Obviously, the most low-carbon diet that you can have isn't necessarily a vegan diet. It is actually a local, local diet, diet yeah. right? Yeah. So locavores, whether you eat meat or not, often are much, much less carbon than anything else. Like, for example, if I go out to the woods and I'm hunting, like I might do in Pennsylvania for a deer or a turkey or for fish or whatever, that's going to be a much lower carbon meal than if I bought a vegan soy protein um, to, you know, piece of whatever they call seitan that was harvested because we cut down the forest in Indonesia and built a palm oil farm palm oil plant. Exactly. because most of those products are just based on palm oil and soy, which are some of the worst deforesting right. products that there are. But that I don't think is your, your, your no. point. Your point is that we're using individualism to derail collective action. And one of the things that the oil industry did to do this um, most nefariously was BP invented BP, British Petroleum, right? The people who were responsible for the Gulf uh, the catastrophe um, and a huge amount of carbon going in the atmosphere, one of the biggest oil companies in the world. BP invented the idea of your carbon footprint. Right. So all these people are going around calculating their carbon footprint. Oh my God, I can lower my carbon footprint if I drive less. I can lower my carbon footprint if I ha- um, am a vegan. I can lower my carbon footprint if I fly less. I can lower my carbon footprint um, if I, uh, I don't know, d- do more yoga. Something like this. I can lower my carbon footprint if I think happy thoughts. Now, um, the, the, <laughs> the truth is that people get obsessed with this and then they spend all of their excess time figuring out how to lower their carbon, personal carbon footprint and none of their time organizing for politics. That's right. So it's a trick because you can't personally lower your carbon footprint to any degree to which um, is going to be effective. Let's talk about BP's carbon footprint. Yes. Let's talk about the United States military's car- carbon footprint. Let's talk about ExxonMobil's carbon it's footprint. Gaslighting. Let's talk about the carbon footprint of cops. 
let's talk about the carbon footprint yeah. of things that matter. Now, if you go ahead and embrace this and you want to be a, uh, that kind of a person, which I totally love that kind of a person who feels a sense of res- personal responsibility. Now, that will change you, but it only matters if it changes you enough for you to take Thanks. political action, collective political action. That's what you need to do. That's what they're trying to they're taking the focus off of their carbon footprint and putting it on your carbon footprint. It's 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 a form of gaslighting. Yeah. Well, and with literally that, actual gaslighting. Actual like, actual, actual gaslighting. Oil and gaslighting. Um, well, it's like yeah, oil and gaslighting. Um, Josh, oil, you're the best. All right. No. Are you at your destination? You. No, I'm I'm oh. on my way there though. But thank you, and we'll see you hope again. To, hope to do this in person soon. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Dear friend. All right, love you, Josh Bye. Fox. Keep it up. Thanks for committing an entire hour to us. <laughs> you got it. Thank you. My name is Anthony Meyer, a labor rights activist from Los Angeles. And this conversation is largely focusing on the role of corporate social responsibility. And so I want to make sure we touch on people as well as the planet. As well as the planet. So I have two questions. Um, first, I'd love for you to talk a bit more about corporate tax evasion um, and the role of paying taxes in Amazon. <laughs> and second, I would love for you to talk about the opportunity for your workers to unionize. We might just point you on these questions, uh, and I don't feel especially qualified to talk about them, but, you know, other than to say on tax, like, I believe, and I think Amazon believes, that we should make a contribution to society by paying the taxes required of us. I mean, a non-controversial statement, but that's, you know, that's my point of view, the company's point of view. Um, on unionization, I, um, honestly, I'm going to skip that one. I just, I don't have a, I don't have a line for you there. So, again, would love to talk. I, I think we're going to take this session a little bit more informal later, but, um, yeah, and, and I think one of the issues, isn't it, is that, you know, when I started out in this, you know, sustainability was one thing, and now actually it's everything. Yeah. And so, um, so actually, um, it's interesting about how that gets managed within any company. That, you know, what, what I hear you saying is that you don't deal with the tax, and you don't deal not with labor, but, but actually those are critical issues that you can't ignore. So, so I mean, it's a bit like everything's interconnected, everything's involved. And so, actually, I, I think, the, I think the, the comment behind the question is that you cannot look at climate unless you look at labor, unless you look at tax, because all those things are interconnected. And, and that, like many uh, people trying to make change, will only have certain responsibilities. Um, and that is sometimes a, a lack within a corporation, because actually, how do you deal with everything? And who deals with everything and who is implemented? So actually it's deeply complex. I think Zach is saying, I can't, I, I'm well, doing this bit, but I can't do everything. Is that what you're saying? Zach? Well, I mean, I think as a company, we recognize that like, you can't, you can't untangle environmental and social issues. So I like, just echo what you, what you, what you're saying. And I, you know, um, you know, I, I think we are but it's, like proud of the world places we, that we create. So in terms of, uh, you know, the conditions in our buildings. I think we feel good about the, the pay, the pay that we pay to our associates. I'm Deandra. I'm from Texas, in the US, and I'm the executive director of Intersectional Environmentalist. And last year, we had an interesting engagement with a lot of corporations in an accountability program. A lot of people who are venturing towards programming that you're trying to develop, I'm sure, behind the scenes. And one of the key opportunities that we saw that I think a lot of people are addressing here today is that there's a lot of lack of accountability with a lot of these solutions being community informed. And I wonder if you could share maybe some of the opportunity that you're seeing with what you're developing and maybe even the conversations that are happening here to connect directly with people who can help inform the solutions that you're building and build those pathways for communication so that there's less confusion about some of the issues that are happening and the way that Amazon is addressing it. Which, which comes back to the whole issue of humility as well, which is as a corporation, how does a corporation engage at the grassroots level and whether, how, how that happens? Right. So more so, what are those immediate 
opportunities for direct engagement and open long-term lines of communication. And just for a little bit of context, a lot of people in this movement, particularly young people who are doing a tremendous amount of work on social media to try and educate, you know, share widespread information, sometimes we're brought in and are given a two-day, one-day crash course on what companies are developing. We know that's not enough time. We need long-term relationships with people to be able to educate our peers. So yeah, just some opportunities that you're seeing to build those long-term relationships directly with communities. Great. And, and also, Zach, on top of that, so I'm on the board of a youth activist group called um, Force of Nature. Mm-hmm. And, and there's this whole issue there. We've had greenwashing, now we have youth washing, which is a lot of young people being involved in invited into corporates, but yeah. more for the show of it, but not actually truly uh, engaging. So, and uh, that just to add to what you were saying. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, engage, engaging with externally at the community level is is super important for us to build out a really robust sustainability strategy. Um, I welcome sort of thoughts and feedback on how we do that scalably. I mean, of course, we've done it. We've done it with kind of organizations like Global Optimism that kind of got us in this place in, in the first place with the Climate Pledge. We work with you know larger NGOs, and I think that's not really what we were talking about. You're talking about like direct community action, and um, you know we have examples of where we're starting to do that. Some of our sort of urban greening projects in Europe, we announced in the last couple of weeks that we are uh, deploying some of our kind of right now climate fund money into urban greening projects in you know ideally in, in sort of more economically socially deprived areas within northern Italy. So there's a kind of you know, there's an intersection of having a sort of environmental as well as a social benefit. Um, I think what we're, what we're wrangling with and wrestling with is like how, there are so many people we could go engage with, right? Like, and we like to do things at an operate scale. How do we, how does this sort of giant Amazon machine interact at the community level? And we have you know, Helen here from, from my team who is starting to think about this from a Europe perspective. We have a team in the US that's also thinking about external engagement and then we have it being Amazon, we have a few other teams in similar spaces doing kind of in the community work. Um, so the, the, the idea is there, the intent is there. Like, how do we how do we do it in a way that's effective? Not the one day, two day workshop. Um, it's it's you know it's an open question. Right? So I, I want to be respectful. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Stone, and I'm a 21 year old student, youth climate activist in New York City. And I did have a question about the climate pledge specifically, but the DPA did want to thank you for the questions that you asked. Um, I'm curious to know your response to criticisms of the climate pledge and greenwashing the work that you're doing, because I live in New York City and everywhere I go, I'm on a subway, I get climate pledge ads, I'm watching TV, prime time I'm getting ads um, with very hollow responses of work that hasn't been done yet by the pledge. I see um, billboards on Times Square on multiple buildings. So for the work that has yet to be done, how is the climate pledge spending millions of dollars on advertising, especially in the most expensive advertising market? Um, can you respond to criticisms of greenwashing for the pledge specifically? Thank you. Yes, I don't think the pledge is about greenwashing. Um, I, being on the inside of the company, this isn't just about a hollow commitment. It's about making real changes. Um, you know, it's not just about forward looking commitments either. Like, you know, we are now 5% of our business is powered by renewables, or we past to to get out of by a French range by 100%. So these are, these are real changes. You're right that we are communicating. You spent millions of dollars, though, on advertising. I mean, he, I'd like an answer to my question. I am respecting. I'd like my question answered. Yeah. Okay. I'd like an answer, though. So I, I just want to stop here for a moment because, um, you know, this is a really interesting debate. And also, I want you to be respectful in the sense that. Um, I'm someone who's been challenging businesses for a long time, but I don't want I don't want Zach here to be the target of everyone's sort of eye. The fact is that yes, Amazon, like many corporations, is not doing enough, but it has to do more. But what we're here to do is to focus on the fact that it is trying to do something, and while that should be challenged, also I want there to be a sort of um, you know Zach is not the problem. You know, Zach is doing his best within a corporation to go to bring about change. So I just want it to be, I recognise there's a lot of issues here with Amazon, and I feel them too. And also I want to sort of be fair to Zach in this as well. So uh, I get that. 
But I just want it to be a sort of balanced conversation as well. Because that is not the problem. Uh, Amazon is not the problem, it's a problem. The system is the problem. And in fact, there's no company, as I said, is going to solve this. But anyway, um, let's carry on. Hi, Zach. My name is Nobiki Konst, and I am from Astoria, New York, which is Queens, which is part of Long Island City. Uh, for those of you who don't know where that is, that is a location of all these things. Just about a month ago, there were many homes in that area that were flooded. Twelve people died in New York because of climate change, because we had massive floods that we were not prepared for or even knew were going to happen. Now, if, say, corporations, real estate developers were taxed, we may have been able, as a city, as the largest city in the country, to protect some of these people. You know, we don't know for sure, but there is absolutely a correlation between whether or not a company is paying taxes, in the U.S. in particular, and how we as cities and communities all over the country are able to protect the most vulnerable people. Many of these people are undocumented. So I'm asking as a company, are you willing to directly invest via tax dollars? And just want to respond to one point you made. You said, well, we respond to the tax policies we have. Um, you also invest in a lot of lobbying to make sure that you don't have to pay those taxes in the United States. So are you willing as a company, and I know it's just you, but has there been any discussion with Mr. Bezos, uh, who received tax benefits for his rocket to space? Um, are you willing to address that elephant in the room, which is tax money, goes to investing in preparing us and protecting us from the ecological disasters that are often contributed by your use of infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I, I appreciate there's a lot of, I can sense there's a lot of kind of anger and frustration with Amazon on issues that I'm not, as I said, like I'm not super well qualified to talk about. I, I actually, I'm not familiar with the situation you're describing, so yeah, I think it'll be irresponsible for me to, you know, frankly answer your question one way or another. So, just to be clear, a question has been asked about that and Zach has responded to that. No, no, I, I think pay taxes and say, are you willing to make the company decision to not lobby anymore to not have the tax? But, you're, but, but I think, I think, I think what, what, so I think this is a really interesting conversation, but I think that you're asking Zach to answer things that he is not able to, to respond to directly. So he's, you know, I think, I think when you ask people a question that they have a responsibility for, I think that's a really fair thing to say, but to, to ask him consistently questions that he cannot answer, I think is great for him. And, you know, I think this is a really useful for Zach to hear that. Great to this. Because, and, and so I'm more interested just for a moment. All right, everybody, that's a wrap. That was Wednesday's show uh, in the year 2010. Yes, you could have played this entire show in 2010 and you would have been like, or watched a show from 2010, uh, and it would have been the same conversation. And I think that we all have a similar feeling right now that we're just on a hamster wheel and the hamster wheel is like rolling off the cliff. And there's some people in the hamster wheel who like recognize it's rolling off the cliff but don't know that they're on the hamster wheel. I feel like that's where we are. Anyways, we will see you for Fem Friday this Friday. I will be back in Puerto Rico, this time covering a political conference, uh, not covering, at a political conference called Somos. And uh, we'll maybe we'll, we'll weave some of that into Friday's show. In the meantime, be well and stay in solidarity. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The no Mickey show.